Hey everyone, and welcome to Alumless. I am Ryan Catherwood. It is February the 16th, Friday. Got a great show for you. Apologies for the technical difficulties we had on the live stream. Sometimes things go right, sometimes things go wrong, but we're here. We're going to record a great episode with Sarah, and we're thankful that you've joined us. Uh, you're watching this after the facts. We're not live, so um, we will uh, try to respond to questions in the stream when we can complete the show and post it. So don't hesitate to ask those questions in the live stream uh, than when we post it on LinkedIn here after we complete the recording. Uh, I am joined by CMAC CEO Chris Marshall. Uh, Alumless is a CMAC production. And of course, please be sure to pick up the bonus section of uh, the alumless by subscribing to our podcast version, which you can find through your favorite podcast app. And of course, you'll hear the Friday cheers section where we explore some other topics not specifically related to university advancement. All right. Well, before we get too far down the line, I want to make sure to introduce our fantastic sponsor. Protopia has created a transformational AI-powered technology that matches questions from students or recent graduates with alumni all over the world that are perfectly positioned to answer them. Without asking alumni to be mentors and participate in programs spread out over months or sign up for a new app or platform, Protopia makes scaling introductions simple. Questions get submitted and Protopia's AI does all the work. Protopia can even target stakeholders like young alumni or lapsed donors and provide them with a meaningful volunteer experience. And who isn't trying to scale volunteerism? So visit protopia.co forward slash alumless for more details and check out the technology that schools like Duke, Denison, Florida State, and the London School of Economics are using to make sure their alumni networks are available to everyone. All right. Well, hey, Chris, we had a little discombobulation, but we're back in the saddle. We're uh, 45 episodes into Alumless, and we're rolling with the punches. Every once in a while, they happen. And the good news is I feel like our community is rather forgiving about these things, you know? <laughs> I uh, think do, people do want to say that. podcast, after all. Yeah, if we could be one out of 45 with a technical live glitch, we're doing okay, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I totally agree, right? I feel like that's a pretty good record so far. Yeah, and um, I agree. I'm surprised we haven't had more technology challenges beforehand, but um, helpful reminder that they can still happen. Uh, but look, you know, we have, it's been a really great month, February. It's been a busy month for, for CMAC. You know, this month we kicked off three new assessment projects with different schools across the country, which has been awesome. We're always trying to provide recommendations that are fitting for those institutions. And um, when you think about it, when I think about it too, you know, what are those factors that really kind of help provide the type of fit that make you know our recommendations come to life through different types yeah. of programs, initiatives, or, or different approaches to engagement? Yeah, um, and I thought when we when we first recorded this, I answered it really well. So I'm going to try to do as well as the second time, right? <laughs> <on this question. laughs> and here's my you answer. Did answer it well. <laughs> uh, here's my answer on this. So uh, we try to deliver a bespoke product every time we work with a new client, so that we're not you know cutting and pasting, cookie cuttering from something else we've done, and being authentic to that you know goal um, and, and wanting institution to get value from our work. I, I see there's three things that we need to understand before we can deliver any kind of assessment work. Um, and what I like to say is we know the industry and we're learning the institution and blending those two things together is the art form in consulting. And the three things that I think are most important are institutional culture. We need to know the place. We need to know what's really going on under the hood there and know and get to know them and the people in the place and the way they are and their traditions and histories. That's number one. Number two is the evolutionary stage of their alumni program is really important. Um, you know, an Ivy League school may have 100 plus years of doing alumni engagement and a regional public institution may have less than 10 years doing alumni engagement. So we need to know that in when we provide a recommendation. And the third one is an obvious one, but really important is budget and staffing resource realities, where they are. I was had a call earlier today with a woman who's at Guilford College, who is one staff of twenty for twenty one thousand alumni, and she's it for alumni engagement. She's doing th she's wearing three hats. 
So recommendations to Guilford are going to be different than what we might do for a school that has, you know, four or five staff in that same scenario with 20,000 alumni. So uh, it's always going to come down to those th things. So institutional culture, evolutionary stage of their alumni program and budget and staffing realities. And sometimes when we do this work, we do the assessments, we learn that there are kind of fundamental alignment issues that yeah. are connected yeah. to the foundation, to the alumni association. How does school, how should schools be thinking about positioning the alumni association and how should alumni associations themselves be thinking about evolving in that area? Yeah. Yeah, I, I use a posture metaphor and when I think about boards, a board leaning in too far, leaning back too far. But I also think of it posture in the same way with an alumni program. An alumni program, in my opinion, needs to lean in on the fundraising side and be part, an active part of what I call it, what we call Ryan, an integrated advancement program and, and not be shy about the fact that good engagement will lead to many outcomes. And one of them is fundraising. So I think you know, we look for, in fact, a lot of our work, Ryan, we get schools call us because they have a problem with that exact fundamental issue where the alumni program has leaned too far away and say, no, 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 we don't touch that dark side of fundraising. We're the friend raisers over here. I mean, literally people don't use those terms as much anymore, but we hear that kind of language from vice presidents pretty often. Um, the other thing I'll share on this one is that in my opinion, that a, a good, the best alumni, and we're going to talk to somebody here in a second that has a program that falls in this category. The best alumni programs out there are ones that are alumni engagement programs on behalf of the university. There are some alumni associations out there, Ryan, as you know, that, and Sarah can talk about this too, I'm sure, um, where the alumni engagement program is for the benefit of the alumni association. So think about that for a second. It's not for that purpose. You don't have an alumni association to make your alumni association better. You have an alumni association to make your university better. And believe it or not, there are many examples out there where um, that fundamental difference is, is, is our fundamental reality is just missed on some leaders. And, and they spend their time building a strong alumni program that's for their association, not for the university. So I think that's a distinction yeah. that's important. Such an interesting area of our work and a really complicated yep. one. So I'm yep. glad we have... Uh, a guest, Sarah uh, Shute from the Wisconsin Alumni Association and Foundation, of course, uh, connected to the University of Wisconsin at Madison. And she's going to help us shed some light on this complicated issue. So let's bring Sarah out to the front. Hey, Sarah, how are you? Hi, I'm great. Happy Friday to both of you. Yeah, good to see you. Thank you so much for being here. Well, it's Perfect. such a pleasure to be here. I'm honored and uh, apologies to the viewers for... Um, <laughs> not being able to see this live, but hopefully we can capture the same energy and experience in this format. We'll Absolutely. make it work. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. So you have a couple of titles. Uh, I was looking at your LinkedIn profile. Your titles have changed a little bit, right? Your organization has changed quite a bit. That means I suspect your work has changed a little bit. What's been going on at the University of Wisconsin over the last few years, such that your titles have changed and things are a bit different now? Sure. Thanks so much, Ryan. Well, um, the most significant thing is that, you know, for over 160 years, the Wisconsin Alumni Association existed as a standalone 501c3 typical alumni operation. Since 1945, at the University of Wisconsin, the UW Foundation existed as the standalone fundraising operation. And 10 years ago, this year, in 2014, our two organizations merged and we remain outside of the university. So we are a standalone 501c3 combined integrated advancement operation. So what has happened over the course of the last 10 years, and Chris, you were just referencing this um, in that last segment when you were talking about, we become an integrated advancement organization. I have two titles because that represents sort of the two um, views of the work that I do internally, functionally, for our organization, on behalf of the university, I'm the chief alumni officer. But we recognize our constituents, 480,000 alumni have recognized Wisconsin Alumni Association for over a century and a half as their connection to the university. So I retained, and we consciously retained the executive director of WAA title, to represent the brand to our external constituents, while internally, functionally, I'm the chief alumni officer. So um, that is sort of what happened in that 
simple title situation actually reflects our evolution and our approach and what we've been working on in terms of how do we operate most efficiently and optimally to serve the university and our constituents? And how are we representing ourselves as a place for our constituents to come in, in whatever way they want to engage? Let me jump in with an unscripted question, Sarah. This one's an easy one, though. I think off the top of your head, you'll know this. Um, other schools have done, you're one of the earlier ones in this process, and other schools have followed <laughs> in this regard. I'm, <laughs> the one I'm aware of is John Valve at Oregon State has a similar model to what you're describing. Tick off a few others that you're aware of. You were just at the CAA meeting where these were all you yes. guys got together. So who else yes. is in the same boat as you in this integrated uh, single 501c3 model? You know, um, when uh, when we were going through this 10 years ago, we used Ohio State. Um, right. uh, while they, you know, we all continue to evolve. Um, we looked at Ohio State a lot. I know that Iowa has made a transition to the Center for Advancement. Purdue, Purdue for Life has made a transition. Those are a couple of peer institutions example, within yeah. the Big Ten. Um, I, you know, one of the points of variation are sometimes that integration is happening and it is within the university and sometimes it's happening and it's separate from the university. And honestly, I have trouble keeping track of, of which is which, but um, it is becoming, I feel like we were sort of in the first wave and now there's another wave where it's becoming increasingly common and where um, that integration is happening. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. What have been some of your growing pains, Sarah? Oh, gosh. You know, you know, Ryan, um, as I reflect back on the last 10 years, it's a little bit hard to, dis to distinguish growing pains related to the merger and growing pains related to just the vast amount of change in our industry and in society and the conditions we're facing right now. So I'll try to suss it out just a, a little bit. Um, you know, I think an early one, and Chris, you referenced this, was, you know, we had 160 years history of being a separate entity where largely the work that we were doing was on, was for, not for the, it was for the benefit of alumni, but the alumni association was the end point. And so we had to tr really transition our thinking and recognize and embrace and celebrate that that we can be an, an entity in people's lives, but our end goal is for the university. We're not the, we're the means to an end. We're a means to engage with the university. We're not the end point of engagement. So, so that was one, I wouldn't say growing pain, but that was an aha and evolution. I think the other ones have to do with just traditional change management, people feeling anxious. Um, we also, 10 years ago, we're getting a new CRM and as a 10 year anniversary present to ourselves, we're getting a new CRM right now. So there's <laughs> process, process growing pains, but um, you know, it is, it's the other pieces of really understanding, embracing the idea that we are all doing advancement, whether you're a frontline fundraiser, whether you're in communications, whether you're doing annual giving, whether you're doing engagement programming or constituent management, we're all doing advancement. We're just doing it in slightly different degrees, slightly Slightly different ways at different points on the engagement timeline for people. So not so much a growing pain as an ongoing realization and the responsibility that comes from that and needing to know and understand what my colleagues are doing. I can't say development's not for me. I don't need to know about that. I have to say I need to learn as much as I can yeah. about that because that makes my work stronger. So we, I just referenced that you were at so the, the CAAE. I said it too quick before. The Council for the yes. Alumni Association Executives is an organization Correct. of 80 to 90 larger size public and private institutions where your position gets together and you have therapy for two days, basically, with each other. And you teach each other you know, sort of best practices. Yep. And it's a wonderful thing. But let's just say you're at that conference and someone says mm -hmm. to you, Sarah, we're headed down a similar path that you guys did 10 years ago. What advice do you give to your colleagues on these issues? Yeah, you know, I think one piece of advice is um, to, to attend to the change man management and invest in the time to, to hear stakeholders. I don't mean send a survey out to all your alumni base and ask their opinion because one of our learnings was Alumni don't care how we're organized. Right. Alumni exactly. feel their connection with the university. And they actually don't really want to know how we're organized. So we never told people that we merged. We just merged. 
Um, <laughs> but internally and 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 our and our high level volunteers their involvement and insights um, from that outside perspective were invaluable to us. So I would say the extent to which you can involve your governing boards and your advisory councils in the conversation, take time to hear concerns from staff so you know um, so you know kind of what to run after first. I'm a huge believer in Maslow's hierarchy. So people are gonna for, people are not going to grasp the existential beauty of a merger until they know, will I keep my job? Where am I going to sit? Can I wear jeans on Friday? Do we get the day after Thanksgiving off? It just, it's Maslow's hierarchy at work. So uh, don't overlook the fundamental basic human needs because people will get to the existential a lot faster. And then I think it's adopt the learning mindset. Um, it's it's accept the fact that can, things will continually change and seek the opportunity and embrace the opportunity to learn and grow within your sphere and make your sphere stronger rather than put walls up and say, no, 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 no. I'm going to get tainted if I do this. Those would be my pieces of advice. Yeah. Great. Great advice. Yeah. I guess sort of a quick sort of follow-up thought, um, Sarah, the, the two title aspects, right? The executive director, Wisconsin alumni, so given the fact that it feels like alumni don't, care right how the how we're aligned do you still think that, that second sort of title that reference to the alumni association like that dual title thing is is necessary if you if you had to do it again would you mm -hmm. is that a recommendation the dual title mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know that's a fair question ryan and thanks for pointing out that uh, what could seem to be a discrepancy there um the reason is less about the the title in our organization and more about the recognizability of the brand. And so we had, you know, we've spent decades and decades creating brand affinity and trust with our constituents that if they travel, if they participate in the WAA travel program, that means something. If they're in a WAA chapter, that means something. If they're at WAA's grandparents university program, that means something. And so we retained it for that recognizability of we are we are the place where you can come and amplify your relationship with the university. It was more we didn't see a need to eliminate it um, because people recognized it. So it's really less about how we're structured and more about what is the brand we are going to put out in front of people when we are focused on one to many engagement at scale. Likewise, the foundation still presents as the foundation when they're talking to a seven-figure donor about a gift fund agreement. Our, we did some study about um, how people react to our two brands and listed characteristics, and each brand has unique characteristics that are a both-and rather than an either-or. So it's really more about how are we presenting our various areas of expertise and our various tones of, of our complexity to particular audiences, kind of like audience segmentation almost. Yeah. But I don't know if that makes sense. It doesn't yeah. really yeah. speak to the structure as much as it is it, to the makes, really it, leveraging it, the brand. Yeah. And, and, you know, it goes back to what I was saying earlier about the first two elements when we do any work with a client, is institutional culture and mm -hmm. uh, evolutionary stage. You yeah. put those two yeah. things together and the WAA makes sense to stay as a brand. Um, yeah. Some institutions, it may be, I mean, it's not a one size fits all in this decision. Yeah. There's going to be nuance based on those two factors, I think. And I tell when I do new employee orientation, I always tell my new colleagues, I'm the executive director of nothing. I'm the executive director of a brand. But, you know, <laughs> to our constituents, it, it means something because right. people know what that is. Yeah. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> Don't tell my boss. It, would you say there's any downside to the, the, the way that you all merge from two organizations into one? Um. I don't think there's any downs. Uh, uh, I will completely transparently. I don't think there is a downside. That said, I can only speak from the perspective of our situation at UW Madison. It was absolutely the best thing we could have done for our constituents and our university for our organization to merge. As we went through, you know, challenging times through the pandemic, there were benefits because Whereas I had colleagues in independent organizations really thinking about their revenue streams, I think about my revenue streams in a different way. I think about my resources in a different way. So in terms of for us, absolutely the best decision. 
we are able to go to scale much more. We are able to go to a higher level of performance in the products and the experiences we put out because we have more resources. And we're really able, I think, to um, use our tools, our CRM, our data, and a similar approach to really strengthen the advancement operation and be a better partner with campus, much more so than I could have done 40 with 40 people 10 years ago. Um, downsides could be in how you go about. And again, that's got to be unique to each individual institutional situation. I would say that without buy-in of leadership and um, without buy-in of leadership of the respective organizations and the university, it could be a downside because you could end up spending a lot of time trying to repair that. We were already in a good place with that. Um, so there could be some pitfalls, uh, but for us and for the results and the outcomes we're striving for with our constituents and our institution is hands down fantastic. Would you say there's a program or initiative that you really you couldn't have done without the merger as, as things have progressed to sort of realize some of those efficiencies, maybe not just a program, but maybe process and improvement that you all have gone through could be either. Yeah, that's a really good question. I know that um, that had we not merged, we would not be where we're at in terms of ability to gather data, analyze data, use data, and use it in a comprehensive and strategic way in thinking about our audiences and the impact of our, our products, whether they're communication or um, whether they're stewardship or whether they're engagement. So that, that couldn't have happened. We wouldn't have had the capacity to use data and be as far along um, as I feel like we are. Um, you know, I think the other thing, and uh, over the course of the last 10 years, we've gone entirely through one campaign and we're in the midst of celebrating our 175th anniversary. And I think about, um, I think about what we've been able to create and produce as far as experiences for our constituents that we, no way could we have done that unless we merged. We didn't have the resources. We didn't have the, the, um, concentration of creativity and and the kind of start to finish uh, uh, resource and process to execute on things like campaign launch events, campaign close events, um, 175th gala celebration, which our entire team did in-house. Um, so I think about those as opportunities that would have been missed, as well as, uh, you know, continued uh, benefit to our constituents. You know, there's an op there would have been an opportunity cost yeah. to them of sort of bifurcating their attention and not all of us being unified um, in in support of the university. You, you you talk about the campaign launch events like it was just a natural thing, and there are some alumni leaders out there who see the alumni see the campaign launch as someone else's responsibility. They're not part of that because they're in the separate group. And you just talked about it so naturally, and it just makes complete sense to me. I love the way you speak about it. So that's great. Um, uh, remind me, Sarah, how long have you been at the University of Wisconsin? <laughs> I've been at UW in different roles since 1994. I started, I'm a student affairs person. I started in residence life right. um, and worked in the sure. profession for about 10 years. And then I went over to the School of Ed in an outreach role. And then I started at the Alumni Association in 2001. Right. And, and Paula was the leader then? Um, Paula was, point. yep. Paula hired me. She was the she was the CEO and president of our organization. Yeah. So you started when you were nine, 30 years ago. Right? <laughs> You're very kind. Yeah. I had a birthday this week. That was a that was an uncomfortable birthday. So I'm, uh, I appreciate you saying that. <laughs> I'm approaching that uncomfortable birthday too in a couple of years. Um, so, so having been at the institution and knowing how the, so you're in the association starting in 01 and 13 years later, 2014, you, you move to this merge. So there's a culture that exists then, and then there's yeah. a culture now. How would you describe the changes in the culture between those two eras, if you will? You know, I think each of our cultures kind of came to the center a little bit. Um, I think uh, we were, um, as a as when I first started, you know, we were people described themselves as a mom and pop operation. And it had been a mom and pop operation. I think it was around 35 or 30 or 35 people when I started and we got to about 45 before we merged. And things were still very much 
very collegial, very collaborative, very family-like, but a little fly by the seat of your pants, a little bit um, whim uh, on, hey, that's a good idea. Let's do that. And I'm not criticizing that because I don't think we were alone. We were just sort of doing things that we thought our alumni would like. And we didn't have a lot of data or a lot of evidence of it, partly because the world it didn't exist so much then, but that was just the way we operated. The foundation at the time, I think, was much more conservative. You know, there were um, pretty strict dress codes under that leader. There were pretty strict um, approaches. And I think after we merged that there were different, there was a leadership change too, but some of that loosened up. Um, and I think our colleagues are, are relieved and happy about that. But I think as we came together, we were able to bring a more one-to-many community perspective and then sure. learn and adopt the, more of the gravitas of when you're talking mm -hmm. to a seven-figure donor and what you need to think about, more of the mm -hmm. discipline of how we measure our work um, and, and really thinking through stewardship and that extending relationships with people. Ours was more of a Let's do this thing. It's over, done. We did great. Boom, on to the next thing. Boom so, to the next, um, right. yeah. We kind of, we relaxed them and they upped our game more. Yeah. So there's a loosening up and a buttoning up to meet in the middle, basically, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Great. Well, what are you most excited about, Sarah, as you think about the, the second half of the year here and the work that you all are doing? Yeah. Thank you for asking that. We are right smack in the middle of our 175th anniversary, Demi Semi Sepsentennial. Um, we did wait a, a minute, bunch wait of minute, cool wait stuff. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Say that again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Say that. Demi Semi Sepsentennial, which and, and, strangely, that is apparently the accepted term for a 175th, and technically it translates to half of half of 700. Why they chose to go at it that way, I don't know. But that's what it translates the to. Correct, that's been fun for all of us to practice all year. The correct pronunciation we is did 175th, some really, Sarah, just so you know. <laughs> that, that's why we call it the 175th. I we did it, some though. really, really, really great stuff last year, including a state tour um, around to, to six or five key areas of the state. We're going to six more this year. So I'm really excited to wrap up that state tour, spread the message of university impact. Um, sort of. Of internally, functionally, like many of my colleagues, I am trying to crack the nut and optimize our chapter network. And how do we harness the passion and the dedication of those volunteers in a way that points in the direction of where we need to go strategically and mitigates and minimizes risk for both entities? So that's not as sexy, but that's a big thing right now. That's a whole, that's a whole other show about. right there on that topic alone. Oh, that. And we'll have to, I'll have to come back and tell you how it goes. Um, you know, the other thing I'm both excited about and working on is, you know, case, case we've been working under the alumni engagement metrics for several years now um, and really excited about where the industry is going in terms of unification on that. We're really working on what's that next step and how do we, now that we know what we're measuring and what to track, now how are we measuring impact? Yep. And really leveraging our new CRM and, and collectively working with our colleagues to think about what are our shared outcomes and how are we showing that we're getting to those outcomes beyond 100 people came to this great thing and had a good time. Yep. Like, how are we yep. showing deepening a relationship? How are we showing cultivation? How are we showing, um, you know, uh, uh, movement towards supporting um, where appropriate? Um, so, yeah, I'm excited about that. I have some team members, including myself, going through the same training that our development directors go through so that we can experience and be familiar with the language and the processes they use and match and marry our great strategy and point of view even more closely in ways that will that will contribute to the enterprise. So that's just a handful. No shortage of things to be excited about. Yeah, I'll say. Um, well, Chris, I mean, normally we would be hanging up on our live show right now, heading over to record our podcast uh, bonus segment. But I think we ought to just press on with uh, Sarah rather than um, <laughs> switching locations and regrouping uh, for 
uh, all the listeners that are watching this uh, on YouTube or on LinkedIn, you're going to get to see the, the bonus 30 minutes uh, on the broadcast, which is which is nice. So okay, that's fantastic. But let's just stop for just a quick second, Chris, and promote our next show, which is in two sure. weeks. Yeah, we have uh, someone I've worked with um, for a while and a uh, wonderful guest, Cheryl Harrelson, currently <laughs> at UC San Diego. But do you know what's next for her chapter? Right? Yeah, she's on May 1. She'll start as the vice president for advancement, leaving an AVP for an alumni engagement role to become a vice president for advancement again, which she was at New Mexico State. She went to UC San Diego in an AVP alumni and career services role. And she's moving back to a VP for advancement role at Georgia State University starting on May 1. But she uh, graciously agreed to stay on our show as a UCSD guest and talk about lots of things. And she's awesome. She's fun, super smart, and has great perspective. And we'll have a great show with Cheryl as well. Yeah, that would be great. Well, um, normally we kick off the, the second half, Sarah, with just for people who aren't all that familiar with the University of Wisconsin-Madison you know, that's to, no one. No one is not familiar with UW. I know everyone's heard of it, but I know lots of people have never been there. People know you're the Badgers and know about Madison, but what's the what's it like there on campus? What's the vibe? Oh my gosh! I, well, I mean, everybody thinks their campus is the most beautiful, but I I have to say we're we're so fortunate. You know, UW Madison sits in a medium sized city, our state capital in South Central Wisconsin, and our our university sits on 936 acres that butt up against Lake Mendota. So you can see, if you can see the picture behind me, um, that's my, the, the West side entrance of our alumni center. And, and oops, I'm pointing the wrong way. That's a lake. So I have, um, I have Lake Mendota right out my window and the lake. And then immediately to my West, no, it'll be that way. Sorry. Um, and my cat, of course, just jumped up in my lap because he knows <laughs> that I'm in the middle of something, um, is our Memorial Union and our Memorial Union Terrace. So we pride ourselves as a university on a really strong sense of place, physical beauty. We also um, really uh, recognize and try to honor and try to keep in the front of our mind that you know, the university has been here for 175 years, but this area of Wisconsin has been occupied for more than 12,000 years by Native people. And so the, we have four lakes in the Madison area, and the Ho-Chunk word is Dejope. And so really recognizing and bringing that history in is something that um, something that's present in our university. You know, it is, we have 50,000 students. Um, if you took the faculty, staff, and students of Madison, um, and considered it a city, it would be the fourth largest city in Wisconsin. Um, and it is it is full of energy. It is full of of energy, uh, irreverence in a spirited, intelligent way, active, um, vocal, but very dedicated, very smart and and humble people. So physical beauty, fun and funny and smart and humble people, a lot of good places to eat, great weather in the summer, great weather in the winter. Honestly, um, that photo was taken uh, in June, wasn't it, Sarah? <laughs> no, actually, this photo was taken last year. We are having such a warm winter. All the snow is melted and actually the lake is breaking up today, which is kind of sad environmentally. It's a little scary um, yeah. for us, but and big winter festivals happening couldn't happen. But this is typically what it looks like yeah. in the winter only. We're, I'm it's here beautiful in the with 10 inches of snow on the ground and a storm coming in tonight. So we're getting it over hey, here in PA. <laughs> You're more wintry than we are right now, but yeah, it's a Madison's a great city, and UW is just a, a beating heart of that. Yeah, no, no pickup hockey out your window at this moment, but uh, on a good year, right? Not at this moment, but I can look up. I can look up the lake shore. Um, any in a regular winter, and the fraternities are right up that street. And literally, in a typical winter, there's at least eight different ice rinks. So it's like I go home from work and I look, and it's like the kids are outside playing ice hockey after school. There's just like hockey, That's hockey, cool. hockey, 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 all the way up the lake. That is really cool. Uh, Chris, you've been to campus, right? You've been to oh yeah, yeah, Madison. I've never been. What's what have been your impressions? It's uh, breathtakingly beautiful. Um, uh, everything Sarah said, but let me throw a couple other um, physical things, and we'll talk about the people a little bit too. But but uh, a beautiful alumni center located on the lake, and it's the only place where I've been where there is an alumni dock. 
because in the yes. summer, <laughs> they, they, you have an alumni boat as well, Sarah? <laughs> yep, we have a pontoon. We have a pontoon boat that was donated and we use that as a way for, for staff teams to go out. We do a member every Friday in the summer. We have members, WAA members take boat rides. It's a stewardship for, for donors. It's sometimes used for student yeah. athlete recruitment. Oh yeah, it's awesome. And when I was there, um, it was about eight, eight to 10 years ago was the window I was working with you guys. And um, one of the things you guys were building at the time was, was Alumni Plaza. Is that the what you call it? Yeah. Alumni Park. Mm -hmm. Park. Alumni yeah. Park. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, the, you know, there's just the clear dedication to, I mean, yeah. at some institutions, the community is faculty, staff, and students. At Wisconsin, the community is faculty, staff, students, and alumni right in there. For so sure. I love that part. For of it. sure. And the other impression I have, too starting with Paula Bonner, your predecessor, Sarah Shute, yourself, and then the, the, the gentleman who oversees the whole thing at the foundation level, Mike Kinetter. You know, three of the best thoughtful, strategic leaders I've ever worked with. Wonderful, wonderful people. So with this great place and ethos and, and culture, there's these great leaders that go with it. So it's just it's one of the top places out there in the country as far as I'm concerned. So well done all around. Thanks. That's, like you guys that's very kind. So Case has the last uh, well, some days. Some, whenever Chris comes to visit, we do. Um, we have a in case the last two summers, and they're coming for a third, is holding their summer institutes right. on our campus. Right. So the and that has been so wonderful um, that they're you know several hundred people who've never been, and we're spreading the experience. Yep. So and Madison is a fun town too to, to just be in the town nearby. I had my fill of cheese curds while I was there. <laughs> 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 so what have you learned about the unique qualities of, of your alumni, Sarah? I'm sure you spent a lot of time thinking about them and what they're all about. How would you describe? You know, I think one, uh, one permeating characteristic of our alumni, and this is probably true everywhere else too, but I'm going to claim it as ours, is you can have the most accomplished person I mean, we have Tony Award winning Broadway stars. We have the, the U.S. ambassador to the U.N., um, we have CNN correspondents, captains in, of industry. And to the person, you will say, oh, my gosh, we're so proud that you're an alum. And they will sheepishly kind of say, you know, I, I had a great education at Wisconsin. I had no idea this, this is where I would end up. And I just got lucky along the way. And I think, and you know, if you hear that from one person, you're sort of like, yeah, 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 yeah. Consistently, even our most accomplished alumni recognize, and thank goodness for us, they do recognize the power of the education and the quality of the education they got, the quality of the experience that shaped them into who they are, and are really humble about it. I think that is that is something that continually impresses me. There is also kind of a really unique, I said irreverent earlier, irreverent sense of humor, sort of an ironic irreverence. Take it to the edge of almost <laughs> being inappropriate, but not quite kind of, kind of vibe that happens. And I think, and this is true, I know of many, many places, just this, this passion for wanting this, the current students to have as good, if not better experience than they yeah. had. And thinking about what are students doing now? How can I make it better? Um, those are things that always consistently stand out. Can you, can you, you off the top of your head? Go ahead, Chris. Real oh. quick, right before you go. Sarah, off the top of your head, one, two, or three names of alums who are the big names in Wisconsin alumni lore. Oh my gosh. I mean, I can name, um, uh, well, you know, you have athletes, Russell Wilson, J.J. Watt, yep. you know, all, all of our tremendous um, athletic program, um, women's volleyball, Dana Recchi. Um, you know, it's Linda Thomas-Greenfield, who is the U.S. ambassador to the U.N., who I have huge respect for and is lovely, lovely. Andre DeShields is the Tony Award winner. Yeah. Manu cool. Raju's um, CNN wow. uh, yep. uh, correspondent. You know, those are those are ones who I... I think of, you know, people lesser known, you know, Allie Willis, who's a musician who wrote the theme song for Friends and also yeah. um, wrote <laughs> most of Earth, Wind and Fire songs as a UW grad. Um, Jim Lovell from Apollo 13 is sure. a UW yep. grad. So John Muir. Um, yeah. All right. You got those them are in. Those are, yeah. those are all there great. We go. There we go. 
one of your alumni surprised you? Um, you know, at the risk of sounding cliche, Ryan, um, it, it has been pleasantly, you know, it has been, um, and, and it has surprised me by the consistency of their excitement and their passion. And I, you know, I'm thinking, I'm thinking now in sports and, and not everything of course is about sports, but I think about, um, our, our women's volleyball team is very, very good. We were really hoping that they would have taken a really, um, had, had another national championship this year. They were too. They, uh, they, you know, Texas was an incredible opponent in the final four. And one of the things that surprised me in a very pleasant way after that was while social media really hammered on the team, the alumni base said, we are so proud of you because it isn't all about winning. We are proud of you for who you are as people and how you represented the university. And it's not, this isn't specific to volleyball. That's just a very recent example. And I think that pleasant surprise of our alumni being able to look beyond maybe the more superficial markers of success and really stay focused on the substantive, authentic, good people. Um, we want to generate good people who are doing good things in the world first and foremost, and people's just undying commitment to that and consistent expression of that. Sarah, Sarah, you've done some really cool things over the recent years in your leadership you. role there. Um, I've followed it and we've talked about it. In fact, I've I've had you talk to my clients because you do such cool things. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, share share a point of pride and what you do to keep things fresh there in your work. Yeah. yeah. You mean besides watching this podcast? Right. Exactly. Right. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, um, you know, I'm really proud of how closely we collaborate with our colleagues in marketing. Um, marketing is a separate division, but we're all in advancement. And, and specifically how closely we collaborate in data. And we, we have for nine years done an affinity survey uh, with our alumni. We have nine years of incredible data that tells us more about how our alumni think and feel and how we've been able to collaborate on what that tells us and then use that to build strategy to try to affect change. So one, I mean, just one tangible example is uh, we noticed that our recent grads um, had had a really, really high feeling of recommending the university and willingness to advocate, not so much um, likelihood to give. So we changed our strategy with them. We took them off of annual giving asks for the first three years after graduation. And we resourced wow. engagement activity. And over the course of the last three years, we have seen their affinity scores, their feeling of connected, their feeling of informed go up when we're seeing all other age cohorts go down. So our ability, and I'm not, it's not braggy, it's really a collective no, no, kind no. of we're going to use data. We're going to look at data. We're going to make choices where we want to move the needle. We're going to thoughtfully apply strategies, and then we're going to see if it worked or not. Really, really proud of that process and how we manifest that over a variety of different um, age cohorts and, and audiences. Yeah, I, I don't think it's bragging at all. I think it's just really smart use of data. And, <laughs> and let's go back to us for a second and just say, and rewind and, and, and say, you just out loud said, we don't, you, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase, but basically you're not soliciting your young alums for the first three years out. So no. do you know of any other we do. Made that decision? I don't. We do. I should say we do solicit them for the days of giving. Day of giving. That's that usually where you hear. Yeah. We yeah. approach as an engagement first sure. and foremost. So we want their participation and we solicit their participation in social right. and stories and a gift if they want. But in terms of the mailers, we we right. don't. We don't centrally from the Alumni Association on behalf of the university solicit them for annual giving for the first three years. Yeah, the day, the day or for membership. Was, yeah, that's great. The day of giving um, pieces feels more organic and grassroots, so it would be natural to include them in that versus the other direct yeah. mail stuff. So let me let yeah. me flip the coin on you and, yeah. and say, you know, in 10, so you've been the leader there now for 10? How long? How many years has it been? 
No, seven. About seven. Seven years in the leadership mm-hmm. role, but you, that's right. The change happened right before. That's right. Um, but are yep. the things that you did have tried that didn't work? This sounds like an interview question. Give me an example of a time where you tried, <laughs> like a job interview question. Something that failed, yeah, right. what did you learn from it? I, I, this is, this is a hard question, not because I can't think of anything, but because it, there's so many, I can't, I can't <laughs> think of, um, one, but well, no, actually there is one, um, that we, we, a couple of years ago, were trying to be really strategic about our chapter scholarship program and work much more closely with the university on trying to align the chapter scholarships and their recipients with university recruitment priorities. And a, a whole year long process was in a, was implemented to have a small group of chapter leaders and work through and pilot a thing. And then at the end of that, we thought, yep, this is going to work. And we announced it and it sort of blew up. It didn't sort of, it blew up. Um, <laughs> and it was not pretty. And uh, I would say the, um, the variable was, even though we had involved some stakeholders in the, a small group of stakeholders in the process, we did not do a good enough job of bringing people along and involving them in the, in the thought, in the thinking. We sort of, we didn't do change management well. So given how well, I feel like our merger did change management to not take that lesson, big miss on, on our part, on my part, but the lesson in that. And when I think back on things that have happened that we've tried tried that we've done that were not optimal it kind of all centers around this idea of we didn't ask our stakeholders enough we didn't seek enough input from them we weren't thoughtful enough about the impact on the the ecosystem and really kind of got more centered on ourselves and our process than on their experience so i i would say that is a theme of when things aren't optimal for us is when we've we've almost We've given ourselves too much credit for what we know or what we think we know and not engage them. Such great self-awareness that what you just articulated is what I would boil down to self-awareness about decisions you made and how you go about it. So when you are facing them next time, you know what to do, not do, right? Because so much value isn't just being asked for your opinion. You know, I think people, people can get over if you don't take it, but if you don't ask is when you get into that riskier space. I have to say those I volunteers that have been engaged for years, you know, and, and are used to being consulted, right? And are going to let you know because you've always asked them to let you know, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. And, um, I, I was just going to say the times I get most mad at my alma mater is when they don't do that because I am that person, very involved, been a donor yeah. forever, all that. And when they do something, I'm like, wait, what? And then I get mad because <laughs> they just yeah. didn't do that. Yeah. 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 Sarah, let's switch gears just a little bit. Let's go to our Friday cheers section of the show. Woo-hoo-hoo. We always try to end our week on something. Maybe it's advancement related. Maybe it's not, but um, something that brings you inspiration, something that's got you thinking. What is your Friday cheers? Chris had mentioned that uh, I was at the CAAE Winter Institute last week. And so that in and of it's like that entire experience um, with with around 65 colleagues who do my who do our jobs all, all over the country um, is is enriching and definitely brought me great cheer. We had a speaker um, during the institute, and I put I put a link in our little chat here. Um, Mohammed Anwar, who who is a, a leader of a company who has transitioned into being a leader and consultant for how to lead. Um, and he and a colleague, Frank Dana, his colleague, not mine, wrote a book um, called Love as a Business Strategy. And that was just such his talk, his humility, his vulnerability, his going through his process of how he learned and what he learned um, was really inspirational just hearing from him. But the content of his book and what he presented was such a good reminder that, you know, we've got all this stuff coming at us all the time, you know, questions about higher ed and questions, you know, with state legislatures for those of us in public institutions and, you know, some worries about declining enrollment and people feel a sense of belonging and all that coming at us. And this was such a great reminder that really it comes down to this Maslow's hierarchy, fundamental importance of the human need for connection and relationship 
and to feel heard and to feel valued and for people to just be real with each other. And time and time and time again, that's when you're stuck, that's the solution. That's the best solution. So that's maybe, that's maybe a little, I don't know, too awesome. heavy yeah. for a Friday. It, it was awesome. you want to read that. Really right? Right? Yeah. I think we should suggest it to our friends at Washburn McGoldrick, maybe for the client conference. They're looking yeah, for some yeah, yeah. Good, good ideas. Oh, we'll he, make sure he was terrific. Them. He was. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that was, that was a great, that was a great thing. I, if I can cheat and add another one completely unrelated recently, <laughs> I came across the best cookie recipe that has like, <laughs> it's chocolate chip with espresso powder and Bailey's in it. And I took it to like a little gathering you, they are to die for. So, you know, if you need something on the opposite end of completely shallow and self-indulgent, I'm happy to send you the recipe. That's definitely a cheer. Man, Love that it. sounds delicious. Yeah. We'll, we'll make sure the link to the book. And if you can send us the chocolate chip recipe, we'll put it in the description for the podcast so people can click on it. I will, I will, I will send it to you after the show. Right. <laughs> Chris, how about you? What's your Friday? Cheers. Yeah, this, this isn't as, uh, decadent or lofty it's just something sort of practical and i've seen this unfold over the last week or so and it's kind of been on my mind something i would have been if we were at a water cooler i'd be asking you about and it's about performance management how we manage our staff and i find it extremely easy i was a former literal coach like i was a coach of a team and when someone's doing well, to tell them they're doing well and coach them up, make them feel good about it, I, that's a natural thing for me. I do it all the time. But I've seen examples recently where, where the great things are happening and the leaders aren't saying anything about it. And I'm like, come on, you got to acknowledge that. And the flip side is I just saw an example. You know, There's a lot of examples when someone is not performing well and to let give them the feedback and to help them get to a point where they're performing well again um, or making a decision that maybe it's not the right fit for them and they need to move on from the organization those are really hard conversations uncomfortable they're confrontational in some extreme cases and they can be unpleasant um but i just saw another example of one where that was done really really well with such kindness and care you know to be clear is kind is the expression i've heard along the way and i saw this example play out recently that it it, it sort of drove home in a consultant role we don't get a lot of time to get in at that level but uh, I've been observing this recently that uh, that people in your role, Sarah, and the people that report to you who manage people, um, how we manage, how we lead, and how we handle performance management is a kind of goes back to some of the basic needs that people have about feeling good about their lives and their position in it. And I just think it's something that you know I love to explore this in a topic one day with one of our guests. But I think it's something that can be done really well and can be done really bad and has a big difference on the impact that the, the organization has as well. So organizational health is a big part of performance management. So that was mine. <laughs> well, I have two from, kind of, you went from kind of lofty of to decadent to practical, Ryan, what are you going to bring? <laughs> Both completely useless. Uh, um, the, uh, we had a great um, sort of sidebar conversation on our CMAC, LinkedIn page, I posted an article from Butler University in Indiana, Indianapolis, who recently are in the process of building new housing for students, but they're going to offer the housing for alumni too. And they've recognized that a lot of Butler alumni uh, love living close by campus and really could use that access to the university's amenities, the gym, you know, other uh, components on campus. And so they're building housing and they're going to offer that housing to graduates. And it was a great article and it was, I'd never heard of that before. It probably yeah. exists in other places. Uh, the only but, thing I've ever um, heard is with senior alumni coming back to near campus, but not to the group that you're talking about. It's more younger target audience. Yeah, recent graduates. Yeah. yeah. And so I thought that that was really a pretty Amazing. interesting Piece. We posted it to the, the CMAC LinkedIn page. If you're not a follower of that page, definitely follow up and um, check out that article. And the other one's kind of silly. My, my favorite uh, comedy television show of all time is, is Modern Family. And um, just a great ensemble cast. Just love the show. And, and Sophia Vergara uh, plays this sort of unforgettable character on that show. And a, really a great comedian who started out her career as a model and so on, but really has a great comedic timing. There's a show on Netflix now where she plays a totally different character. She plays a, 
a drug dealer named Griselda Blanco, who was famous in uh, Florida during the, the 80s. And I just thought she did such a tremendous <laughs> job, like transforming from the character we saw on Modern Family to this ruthless drug dealer. And, um, you know, there's a true story, right? And of course, em embellished. But she was a producer on the show. So she, she had her eye on that character, I think, for many years. And I thought she did a tremendous job. It's a mini series. I think it's like seven or eight episodes. So if you haven't checked it out, it was well worth your binge uh, time for some Netflix. All right. Well, thank you, everyone who is listening for picking up the podcast. Sarah, great to have the chance yeah. to chat with thank you this week. So much fun, as always. Wonderful insights. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, we'll it was great being here. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. We'll be back with Cheryl uh, Harrelson in uh, two weeks' time. And uh, for Chris and for Sarah, I'm Ryan signing off for this week. Thanks so much. Take care until next time. Bye. I'm Wisconsin. I got my pendant up for you.